Part six, the progress. Fundamentals of accessibility in terms of the people, places, plexus, and production have entrenched themselves over generations of empirical data. But the future of accessibility is by no means static. Our last section, the progress, delves into the dynamic coevolution of place and plexus over time. This begets fascinating discussions of accessibility as it relates to topics such as technology, biology, scaffolding, modularity, and origami. While this section on the progress is the final section of the book, our story of accessibility is not complete. As we close the book by considering the possibilities, good, bad, and indifferent, of autonomous transport, we recognize that the future of accessibility is a story that future generations will need to continue to write. To do so, and to do so well, hopefully involves a comprehensive understanding of the elements of access. Chapter 14, Life Cycle Dynamics. Life cycle theory traces out the deployment path of technologies from birth through growth to maturity and then decline. These S-shaped curves have successfully described the deployment of many technologies. Transport networks among the slowest technologies to deploy may take decades to reach maturity. Railroads were first deployed in the U.S. in 1830, they peaked in 1920, and their length has been dropping since. Freight railways continue to gain traffic, but they do so on fewer and fewer tracks every year. Understanding this process and where any given technology is on this curve is important for making investment decisions. As one might imagine, the best investments are made in the early years, so there are diminishing returns setting in by maturity. Adding capacity to a mature network is often foolish. Generally, forecasts in early years of an important and fast-growing technology underestimate demand. In the later years of slower-growing, mature technology, the forecasts overestimate demand. Just as important as the growth stage is understanding decline and disinvestment. Many technologies see collapse eventually. Public transit in the U.S. saw a massive collapse from the late 1940s through the 1980s. The post office is going through a similar trend today. As shown in Figure 14.1, ramp meters in the Twin Cities have more or less reached maturity. New technologies may make ramp meters obsolete. The reasons for decline are often related to the emergence of new technologies. While models of growth are perhaps adequate within the domain of an existing growing technology, predicting the emergence of a new technology is much harder. All technologies have both advantages and disadvantages. Whether a new technology, however much better it would be if deployed, can overcome the defensive moat of an existing technology's sunk cost is very much unclear. The new technology has to not only be better if fully deployed, garnering all the network effects, but also at much smaller scale while it is just transforming from birth to growth stages. Investors and venture capitalists promoting the new technology network can only run losses for so long before they need to show some profits to justify continuing investments. The difficulty remains for predicting modes that are still growing. When will they reach market saturation? For instance, how many flights will people take per year? This requires examination of fundamental factors. One of the lessons, though, is what appears to be exponential growth in the early years of a technology is, in fact, just logistic growth. All technologies have limits. Exponential growth cannot go on forever. It is unsustainable. That which is unsustainable does not sustain. Another lesson is that it is hard to determine the shape of the logistic curve, that is, where it levels off from the shape of the exponential curve in the early growth period. 14.1 Technology Substitutes for Proximity in the dark age before electricity, great if not satanic mills were located adjacent to waterfalls to provide direct energy. This is the origin story of many early industrial revolution cities. The development of the electric grid, first DC, then AC, untethered milling from the falls. Figure 14.2. In the age before the streetcar, people lived within walking distance of their jobs. Downtown was very important. With the streetcar and subway, downtown remained important as the destination of a radio commuting, shopping, or entertainment trip began farther out in the suburbs. But with the automobile, not only residences, but first shops and then workplaces could become untethered from their downtown anchor at the head end of the transit system. Downtowns in some U.S. cities haven't added employment in many decades, and many more have lost market share to the greater metropolitan regions. Yet the individual's daily activity pattern itself was still confined to a roughly 30-minute radius, sometimes referred to as Marchetti's constant, but identified by Zahavi and others earlier when studying travel time budgets. This helped glue cities together. With forthcoming mobility technologies like autonomous vehicles, this commuting budget range could theoretically expand. 30 minutes of actively engaged traveling by driving, biking, or walking is not the same as 30 minutes as a disengaged passenger in a commuter train or autonomous vehicle. If autonomous vehicles were to actually reduce congestion, travel could be faster during the peaks, although induced demand could counter these gains. Autonomous vehicles with shorter reaction times could speed travel on uncongested roads as well, depending on the speed we allow them to go, all of which suggests less physical tethering between home and work and perhaps even more decentralization. 
With new and better telecommunications technologies, the requirement for in-person meetings could also drop. With fewer in-person meetings, there are fewer days per week that one needs to go to work, which means a weekly commuting budget may be a more appropriate concept than a daily one. It also means off-peak travel is more likely. Non-work trips could also replace some of the time saved by reduced work trips, but they may not be as long or as peaked. Telecommunications also no longer requires wire, as wireless gets more efficient. So the need to be on the wire telecom network to conduct business would not be required either. Two other sources of tethering of people to their infrastructure, energy, and water supply. It is worth noting that rooftop solar energy is increasingly becoming technically feasible. Without the need to attach to an electric grid, though maybe still wanting to due to load balancing, Though, with enough energy conversion efficiency, this doesn't matter. And with more power available on large rooftops where land is less scarce, score one more for decentralization. People have, long wi- lived with, people have long lived with cisterns, wells, and septic systems. To be clear, cities are getting better too. While life for the disconnected may be improving, the quality of life for highly tethered urbanites is also rising. Urban air pollution will drop as renewable energy and electric vehicles become standard, and social amenities will always be closer in terms of travel time. Where anyone will live depends on their preferences and the opportunities available to them. The good news is advances in technology suggest more opportunities will be available. The bad news is your opportunities depend on the preferences of others. We cannot be alone in wanting to live in a city of 100 million people. Imagine the specialization, food, stores, and entertainment possible at that scale. We just need more than 99 million of our closest friends to agree. 14.2. Conurbation. Endosymbiosis in biology refers to the idea that organelles of eukaryotic cells, like mitochondria and chloroplasts, were originally free-living microorganisms that combined symbiotically to mutual benefit. The electric self-starter is the internal combustion engine automobile example of what we might call techno-endosymbiosis. Charles Kettering developed the electric starter, which temporarily overloaded the motor. Interestingly, Kettering modeled his innovation on the self-starter with his work on motorizing the cash register when he was an engineer at National Cash Register in Dayton, Ohio. Kettering later founded the Dayton Engineering Laboratories company, Delco, soon acquired by General Motors. The self-starter eliminated the disease of Ford's fracture, a broken arm resulting from cranking accidents. After Kettering, the automobile became an electric system in miniature. Its generator with a battery was the central station, which distributed current throughout the network to uses like starting the car, but also for headlights and later radios and other purposes. Surprisingly, battery makers boom not from selling batteries to makers of EVs, but from selling to makers of gasoline-powered cars containing an electric self-starter. The internal combustion engine adopted the battery as a self-starter and is a technological version of the biological process endosymbiosis. Hybrid vehicles which ramp up the battery so that the vehicle can travel on either electric or gasoline power are another version of this. Techno-endosymbiosis can be seen as the gasoline-powered car adopting the best feature of electric vehicles of the early 20th century. Technologies are analogous to species in many ways. Cities are not. Rather, they are analogous to colonies in the insect world. The complex of technologies called cities reproduce by spawning what are appropriately called colonies, as Rome famously did this two millennia ago with its colonia. Cities, or somewhat more precisely, metropolitan areas, are not simply legal jurisdictions, but have an economic definition based on economic inflow and outflow. Cities, commuting regions, grow spatially and incorporate formerly independent cities and towns that become subcenters through the process of conurbation. They also spawn their own colonia, often local, that are called suburbs. As one builds not just intra-metropolitan but inter-metropolitan networks, one can certainly imagine multiple cities forming large megaregions with overlapping flows, particularly as networks of subcenters arise. To illustrate the concept, consider the Twin Cities. St. Paul and Minneapolis were once somewhat independent market areas, connected by the river and trails, but for which transport costs were too expensive to go between them on a daily basis. With the advent of the horse car, the steam railroad, and then the streetcar, and finally the motor car, interaction costs declined, and the cities were bound together as a single economic unit. But even if governance remains divided, to this day... But these are not the only two cities in the region ultimately forged into a single unit by an urban endosymbiosis. There are places that existed before the Twin Cities, or before the Twin Cities became the Twin Cities, and were later incorporated, and those that were spawned by the Twin Cities. Just among the counties in the local Metropolitan Council region, we find seven county seats that were founded independently. In general, the county seats, shown in Table 14.1, are on one side of the major rivers, the Mississippi, St. Croix, and Minnesota, and were founded from downstream to upstream as places continued to develop and settlers moved farther inland 
in search of unclaimed land and resources. Which of these county seats, or any other early town, was to be the eventual winner, the title of which is now held by the primary city, Minneapolis, was contingent both on geography and history. Hastings, figure 14.3, for instance, was promoted as a new Chicago by Ignatius Donnelly until 1857. Minneapolis grew because of the power of the St. Anthony Falls waterfall, which was important only because electric grids were not yet developed. Had history been a little different, Minneapolis might be a suburb of Hastings or farther afield Red Wing, 1853, home to 1,250 people in 1860. At some point after the construction of intercity railroads beginning in the 1850s, streetcars beginning in the late 1880s, and paved state highways from the 1920s, these semi-independent outposts firmly attached to their location in the ground became more and more mutually interdependent. Today, development is contiguous and people are as likely to identify with the primary city of Minneapolis, the metropolitan area, or the state as they are with their most local city or township level of government, much less their county. There is no exact date when an independent town becomes more part of the metropolitan system and less an isolated entity. The change is a process that develops over time, not an instantaneous phase shift. There's also no obvious threshold, 25% out commuters, 50% out commuters, etc., for independent versus interdependent. Yet, at some point, a town is so enmeshed in a larger urban web, it can no longer simply stand alone if its links were cut off or returned to earlier, say, 1860s levels. The Twin Cities region as a whole may not existentially need the city of Shakopee, which, among other things, notably exports entertainment like racing and amusement parks to the pleasure seekers in the rest of the region. But Shakopee does need the rest of the region. The body can cut off the hand and survive, if diminished. The hand cannot cut off the body. 14.3 Mega Regions Just as there is more economic activity and commuting within cities than between cities, and within metropolitan areas than between metropolitan areas, there is more activity within mega regions than between them. One possible mega region configuration is shown in Figure 14.4. So there's some advantage to thinking about mega regions as a territory over which some economic and transport decisions should be made. It should not be the dominant framework, as local travel and economic activity within a metropolitan area is much greater than the trade between such areas. As metropolitan areas are often conurbations of pre-existing cities and towns, mega-regions are combinations of existing metropolitan areas. But for intercity travel, it might make sense to think of nearby metropolitan areas as interacting. And historically, with transport becoming increasingly faster over time, the area of daily interaction steadily expanded. In the city of the 1800s, when people traveled at walking speeds, Cities were much smaller than they became first with a streetcar and then with the automobile. Even now, in the Northeast Corridor, there are a reasonable number of people who regularly commute between nearby cities. Philadelphia to New York, Baltimore to Washington. And a smaller number who commute longer distances. Washington to New York, usually on a less than daily basis, but often enough. While transport had gotten faster over time, recently it seems to have stagnated. Some people view high-speed rail, very fast trains, as the next logical step. Others see virtual connectivity via the internet as the next step, which leads to a more global community with worldwide interactions rather than high-speed rail. It depends very much on the context as to whether HSR is economic. Autonomous vehicles will emerge as well, and inevitably lead to people who own such vehicles being willing to travel longer distances, as it will lower the costs of travel, since people will not need to engage in the driving task, and can do other things with their time in motion. The key planning problem is that land use decisions are made very locally, at the township or municipality level, while important transport decisions are made at the regional or state or national level. Yet land use decisions generate demand for streets and highways outside of the local jurisdiction that permitted them, while transport decisions affect local governments and their residents and workers. Clearly, local governments are not keen to let metropolitan areas make land use decisions or even have veto powers and similarly cannot be responsible for regional transport decisions. Following loosely the model of London, the United Kingdom is beginning to devolve national transport and other spending powers to metro mayors who oversee so-called city regions. This has been perceived as a transfer of powers away from the local to the region, rather than devolution from Westminster to the city. The devolution process has been rather ad hoc, relying on cooperation and self-selection of regions. 14.4 Path Dependence If you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. Path dependence is the idea that where we are today depends critically on where we were yesterday. Where you live might depend on what job you took, which depends on what your previous job was, and where you went to school, and a different decision anywhere along the way would change today's position. Nowhere is this more true than transport, 
On the one hand, it is obvious that certain locations were destined to be important cities because of significant natural advantages across different technological eras. Chicago is at the pivot point between the vast agricultural lands to the northwest of the United States and the shortest land path to the East Coast. It was natural that railroads that would flow through the point on the map we now call Chicago. Geography favored this as a point of accessibility. This was reinforced by the railroads and subsequent development. On the other hand, many city sites that were selected for natural advantages in one technological era, the Romans selected London and the Dutch and English chose New York in large part for their capability as ports, remain important even after that technology becomes obsolete. With the logistics revolution and the new dominance of container shipping, London shipping has moved northeast to Felixstowe as large container ships cannot easily ply the Thames, while New York City shipping has migrated to the wide open spaces of New Jersey. The one-time advantages result in a set of complementary investments and interrelated decisions that take on a life of their own. Because of local trading advantages, commodities markets, banks, insurers, and other related organizations located nearby. A critical mass of those institutions felt no need to migrate just because of their initial reason for being banished. While a building is under construction, temporary framing will often be used until the more permanent structure is erected. Once the final building can stand on its own, the false work is dismantled. In a sense, everything is false work for what comes later. This kind of mutual complementarity happens repeatedly in transport. Airplanes are the perfect example of mobile capital. If Amalgamated Airlines no longer wants to serve a particular city pair, the airplane can easily be redeployed elsewhere. Yet 80 years into the commercial aviation industry, airlines today serve mostly the same hubs their predecessors did on the airmail routes of the 1930s. American Airlines is still in Dallas, United in Chicago, Delta, Northwest, in Minneapolis, and so on. A similar example occurs with today's urban bus networks, which often are all but identical in routes to the streetcars and trams that preceded them. While very few decisions are completely irreversible, transport decisions come close. Where we place a right-of-way or an airport will explain where that facility will be decades or possibly even centuries from now. A slight deviation from the efficient path to solve a short-term problem today will cost travelers time for years to come. It is important to get the design right for the longer term, yet getting it right from a transportation efficiency perspective might be getting it wrong in terms of social costs. See the damage wrought by many urban freeways, such as the well-documented case of I-94 through the Rondo in St. Paul. But a slight deviation from the path will also change what the long term is. Build a bridge here rather than there, and you will adjust all of the roads feeding into the bridge to meet it here instead of there. And then land will be developed along the road to here to take advantage of the newly created accessibility. Properties will be platted. Buildings will be built. Travel and trade patterns established. And other critical dependencies will come to assume that the bridge is here. At some point, say 50 years in the future, the bridge will need to be replaced. Even if there was a better location than here initially, after five decades of adaptation, it is quite likely that here is better now. The whole may have been better were a different initial decision made, given conditions at the time. Given current realities, however, that path must now be foregone. Even if we didn't run freeways through cities, new cities would grow up around freeways. These edge cities are 20th century products and built on greenfields, so there was little to no community to sever. But the freeway hardly brings both sides together. In transport, we say build it right the first time because there won't be a second chance. And that is true. But also remember the world will adapt to whatever we do, and we cannot let the perfect be the enemy of the good. 14.5. Urban Scaffolding Like buildings under construction, cities are built with scaffolding. Remove the scaffolding and cities remain. Yet what is scaffolding and what is permanent is not at all clear. Yesterday's permanent structure is today's scaffolding. Take, for instance, the deployment of streetcars in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Those streetcars enabled, not coincidentally, suburbs from which their customers, resident travelers, would use on a regular basis to commute to jobs and journeys to shops. Yet, in the mid-20th century, those streetcars, urban scaffolding if you will, were removed, just as horse cars before them, and the city itself remained. Those streetcar suburbs still exist sans streetcars. That which enabled their construction and occupancy was eventually unnecessary and removed. Ports were the raison d'etre for many cities, yet in today's era of containerization, ports that failed to make the transition for whatever reason withered. The city that port enabled remains. These include such places like San Francisco, New York City, and London, which today lack significant port operations yet have maintained or gained in status. The port scaffolding was removed, and the rest of the city was self-sufficient without. However, in the absence of an initial port, those cities may never have been more than hamlets. The scaffolding enables the construction of an urban web of social, economic, and technological elements that eventually become thick and secure enough that the initial framework can disappear without taking the system down with it.
but at the same time no one envisioned the Porter streetcar as temporary. They seemed quite permanent. Past accessibility catalysts repurposed to new roles, so what today seems permanent may simply be the scaffolding for tomorrow's city. 14.6. Modularity Designs might be comprised of individual discrete building blocks, modules, that are combined into a pattern, or may be holistic, unitary, so that a small part cannot simply be interchanged with something similar without breaking the whole design. Most things are combinations of the two. Software has moved very much to modular architecture, and as systems become large and complex, this is a logical way of reducing complexity. On the other hand, there are advantages of integration, as evidenced by unibody construction on a car, compared with componentized body on a frame. In surface transport, we have lots of modules. Vehicles and infrastructure are often separated. In elevators, they are not. Bridges and roads are distinct. Each link is a separate module, but you can't build half a link and expect it to function. Horrid asphalt is more unitary than individual bricks. Traffic signal engineers operate on a system designed by highway engineers and planners. Consider, for instance, the traffic signal timings as a distinct element that can be optimized with everything else, lane configurations, pavement, etc., fixed. Traffic engineers recognize that traffic signal timings affect the quality of flow upstream and downstream, and so will often time signals as a system to optimize flow, not just at the signal, but for a corridor or a city network. This is recognition of a unitary aspect of the road network. However, this unitary nature of network logic breaks the unitary nature of a neighborhood, where we might want the signals configured for pedestrians and where we might want roads redesigned to serve local rather than regional needs. A modular architecture where the signal is timed independently obviously can do no better than the system-wide performance metric of the overall system, but at least enables the maximizations of the quality of the neighborhood. If the appropriate local settings are chosen for the traffic signal module, at the expense of system-wide optimality on a mobility dimension, similarly, a purely local design may wreak havoc with system-wide flow and have implications elsewhere on the network. While well, a module can only optimize for one master, and potentially less optimally than a unitary design, it can alternatively satisfy across multiple masters. In contradistinction, a unitary architecture must sacrifice one master for the sake of another. Modularization provides flexibility at the cost of at least one dimension of optimality. A unitary design lacks flexibility and adaptability. A new wing design will not help a unitary airframe. The job of the designer is to understand these trade-offs and select appropriate architectural strategies, unitary versus modularity, for a particular design choice, and then design the modules as appropriate. While there is no one true path, this is not religious. There are consequences and values at play. 14.7 Network Origami The dynamic evolution of urban systems analogizes to the art of origami, or paper folding. Allen's paper folding story is as follows, as shown in figure 14.8. The original state is a flat sheet of paper, then folds are made in it, and the paper gradually changes into various objects and displays different attributes. Then folds in the paper generate different traits and let the paper take various forms. There are many choices to fold the paper at the beginning states, while fewer and fewer choices remain in the ensuing states. In the evolution tree, each of the objects has a past state and a future state, which both differ from its present state. In a dynamic system, if we limit the scope to a particular state and model the system in terms of the attributes present at that state, we ignore the important factors leading to system evolution, and we cannot properly capture the future changes of the system. Allen states that the essence of an object, a bird or a box, is not only contained in the folds, but also in the order in which they are made, and the order plays a vital role in forming the object. If we describe the folds simply with their present attributes without considering the order of the formation, and then we try to predict the future style of the object based on the information we get from the current folding, we necessarily obtain the wrong conclusion. Choosing one fold, development path, requires the abandonment of other folds. Furthermore, each fold influences the emergency of the folds in the ensuing states. That is, it will increase the emergence probability of some folds while decreasing the emergence probability of some other folds. For example, Folding the original flat paper along the diagonal line will increase its chance of changing into a bird, but decrease the chance of changing into a box in the future. A fold is called a good fold when it increases the probability that the paper evolves to the object we desire. Now, let's imagine a transport project, capacity expansion or adding new routes, as a fold of the evolution tree. Evaluating the project should not only be based on its current capability in improving traffic performance, but it also depends on how long and how well the project could help the system sustain functional operation and depends on what evolutionary direction it is leading the system to follow. Some highway projects increase flexibility and adaptability. 
Others foreclose future opportunities. Effective highway planning that makes the system function over the long run cannot be found through myopic system optimization or equilibrium at a particular moment, because even though we can plan the system to reach such optimization or equilibrium at some state, we cannot guarantee the system would still be optimum or in equilibrium in the next state. For an evolutionary system, system optimization or equilibrium does not necessarily exist. 14.8 Volatility begets stability. The human body evolved over time through natural selection. The entire body depends on various components, heart, lung, brains, etc. And if any one of them fails, the whole fails. Thus, it made no sense to evolve a brain that would noticeably outlast the heart, or a heart that would outlast the lungs. Any effort in a longer-lived brain would be moot as the heart would fail first. And similarly, any attempt to have a heart that would beat longer than the lungs could breathe would be over-engineering. The marginal rate of return on extending the life of any critical organ would probably be equalized in such a scenario. A similar logic has been alleged to apply to autos, with planned obsolescence. Why design a frame that outlasts the engine? The ideal, from a narrow efficiency point of view, is for all parts to fail simultaneously with no point in spending money on repairs, and no excess wasted at the outset by having parts last longer than the whole. In fast evolving technological systems, as automobiles may once again become, Replacement is often more effective than repair. Both the human body and technological artifacts like automobiles are finite systems. While the date of reckoning for bodies or cars may not be known in advance, nobody naturally lives past about 120 years of age, and intensively used cars do not economically or typically last past the age of 20. But there are other systems that are potentially infinite. These include cities and networks. While a city or network may not last forever, its potential lifespan is quite uncertain. These seemingly infinite systems last significantly longer than their component artifacts. Just as Heraclitus said, no one ever steps into the same river twice. One never steps into the same city twice. It is continuously evolving as parts are abandoned, destroyed, replaced, or rebuilt. Quite often, the city, while changing its buildings, maintains its networks, whose topographical and topological structure outlasts its buildings, in part due to property ownership regulations. The example of London being rebuilt using essentially the same streets and property lines after the 1666 fire illustrates this case. Cities and their networks last longer because their components fail at different rates. If all of the components, buildings, plexus, networks, social structures, failed at the same time, a fire plus a breakdown of the legal system ensuring property rights, then the site could be abandoned. But as long as most components last, a few failing will not destroy the city. The resources from the remaining components can help rebuild the failed ones. Similarly, resilient networks do not fail together, and the failure of one link, given some redundancy, will not cause the network to collapse. This volatility and failure rates of components leads to a more stable whole. The price is that only piecemeal rather than systematic overhaul of the system is permitted.